That's the bottom line. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest command, as Christ mentioned, is to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. But oftentimes, we only give part of our heart. I'll give you just this much, Lord. The rest, I have for somebody else. I titled the message, What Matters Most? So let's turn to Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12 has something to teach us. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse 1 to 3 is the, the starting off passage that we'll be taking a look at. And the title is, What Matters Most? Let's ask ourselves, what matters most? Now, a legacy that lasts can only be gotten when we decide to do what matters most. What lasts is when we do what matters most. Now, in the last few months, I've had the privilege to teach two different, very different types of audiences. Um, one of the audiences is from ages 5 to 12. And then the other audience is from 18 and but, see, every time I've had to teach, I've always placed myself in an area where I would ask myself, what really matters most in this teaching? And before I, I start teaching, I try to make sure that I really know this passage, I really know this subject. So just in case a student decides, I have a question, Pastor Devian, what does that mean? Or uh, this happened, this happened, why would that happen? Why would God let that kind of thing happen? So I try to prepare myself, you know, uh, try to see these questions coming. But what I've found is that I really need to be ready to have an answer, to have a proper answer, the biblical answer. You may have heard of this uh, really famous physicist named Richard Feynman. And what Richard Feynman used to say is that if you want to master something, teach it. He also went on to say that if you can't explain something to a first-year student, then you haven't really understood your subject. And this I've found to be very true because if you truly understand something... I think we should be able to convey the importance of a subject even to the little child, right? Just as, just as much as we can convey the importance of a subject to a little child, we also ought to be able to take the same subject and convey it to the 18-year-old or the college student or the university student who's working on his thesis. But this is also... Important for us to understand the question, what matters the most and ought to be taught to kids just as much as it ought to be taught to young adults, just as it ought to be taught to adults today. What is the most important thing to know? So this question matters to me more now than ever because I hope one day that the Lord would, Lord willing, would allow me and my wife to have a child. But then this question matters because I also need to know what am I going to teach this child and what is he going to retain after I leave this world. Today the world feels it's very necessary to teach kids all kinds of things. There are some societies that believe that education is the key out of poverty because they feel that poverty is what plagues humanity. And then there's other societies that feel that, you know what, our, what our society needs is, is more compassion. We ought to teach our kids how to be more compassionate to everyone else's problems in this world. And then there's other societies that feel that, you know what we lack? We lack a true identity. And so they try to teach kids identities. But I think the world is really missing the point. I don't think they're trying to really deal with what the main issue is. 
the world is at a point where they want to deal with the symptoms of the, of the world or the symptoms of sin, but they want to try and do it without God's help. Right? Injustices in this world, sin. But we want to try and deal with it without God. And that seems to be where the world is at. They aren't asking themselves the most important question. What matters most? And I think we as Christians, we can fall into this trap as well because I think that there are so many distractions in this life that can just take us away from what matters most. Now I'm kind of drilling this question into you. What matters most? Tell us! Just tell us! (laughs) I think as the average Christian in this world, if you ask on this side of the of, the, uh, of this auditorium right now, hey, what matters most in a Christian's life? And then I walk over to this side and I'd ask somebody, hey, what matters most? I think I'm going to get two different types of answers. Perhaps if I ask even more people, I'll get more types of different types of answers. Now, in the passage we read, we're about to read Hebrews chapter number 12, verse 1 and 3. Let's take a look at it. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him Endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. See, I think uh, the author here, Paul, uh, I'm going to just go with Paul. I think Paul is trying to illustrate something for us here, is that he's trying to draw a picture of what could be a hybrid of a marathon and a relay race. I think what he's trying to pull and show to his church is that there is a marathon that was started by none other than Jesus Christ, the author. And he started this race and he started running it. And during the first century, he passed it on to holy men called the apostles. These apostles ran, so to speak, this race, and eventually they came to a point where they could pass it on to someone else. They could pass their baton of this relay race to somebody else. So eventually, we get to the first century Christians, and so on and so forth. They ran their race. Eventually, they passed it on to somebody else. Now, here we are in 2023. So, if you're a teen... If you're a young adult, if you're an adult, you have a baton with you. You have a baton with you. Millions of Christians today are running this race. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a runner, okay? I I think you can tell. But when you look at a runner, I, I had to do a lot of research onto this because I wasn't into track and field or anything like that. I had to do a lot of research. And I found out that there are uh, quite a few reasons for why a person can get disqualified. So I looked into it. So first reason a person can get qualified before they even start. If they start wrong, they get disqualified. Okay? A false start is one of the best reasons for a person to get disqualified. Praise the Lord, Jesus Christ started already. So Jesus Christ started this race well. Second reason for somebody to get disqualified is dropping the baton. Whether in between the handover or just out of the lack of care, if they drop the baton, they're disqualified. Second, uh, third reason, if they're stepping out of something called the exchange zone, they get disqualified. Fourth reason, If there's interference or obstruction, 
which causes them to stumble and get disqualified also. Fifth reason, lane infringement. That means you need to stay in your lane. If you leave your lane, get disqualified. And then sixth reason, unsportsmanlike conduct. Intentional obstruction, interference, foul language, those will get you disqualified in a relay race. So, if we're Christians, we have a baton and we're trying to pass this baton. You could say that we've finished our race once the baton has left our hands and has been given over. And I think this illustration that Paul used to show what the Christian life is like is to also show that if we don't know what really matters most, we can fail from finishing properly. And as someone that tries to help as much as I can, I've heard stories of heartache. I've heard stories of pain and toil. I've heard stories that would just make me cry sometimes. And I can't help but think to myself, what if that person just obeyed? Just obeyed God? What if that person just kept doing the most important thing? Kept doing what matters most? So, let's answer this question. What does matter most? What matters most? And I'd like to answer this question in two parts. Our life on earth isn't extremely long. It may seem so, but honestly, in the grand scheme of things, when you zoom out, our life is very short on this earth. So we only have a small period of time where we run this race, and then we get into what you call the exchange zone. And once you're in this exchange zone, you're passing your baton over. Hopefully, we get to the exchange zone. James 4.14 says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. And at the end of it all, we hope to have finished our, la- our race. We have hoped we would have finished well. So let's figure out what we should be passing over. What matters most? But before we do, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for today. Everyone that's here, Lord, for their attentiveness. We're grateful, Lord, for the food you've given us and just the amount of grace you've given us. We're thankful, Lord, for Pastor White, for his birthday as well. We pray that you would bless him. But also, Lord, help us now to pay attention. It's very easy for us to drift off. But Lord, right now, this message right now, I pray, Father, that you would speak through me and that as Christians, that we'd be able to hold on to the, the truth of the faith, Lord. I pray, Father, that you help us to understand what matters most in this life so that we could pass it on to the next generation. We thank you and praise you, Lord, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's getting dry, man. Okay. So, number one, two parts, I said. So two points. Number one, loving God. Loving God. If you don't mind. (laughs) Thank you, Glenn. So let's turn to Matthew chapter number 22. Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verse number 36 to 38 is where we're going to get off, uh, go off of. What matters most can be answered in two different parts. The first part is loving God. And so you have this young man who comes to God, to Jesus, and asks him, what is the greatest commandment? So verse number 36, the young man goes, the lawyer, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Verse 38, this is the first and great commandment. Thank you. 
One part that matters most is our love for God. And why does this matter? Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Right? John 14 verse 15 says that. As I had mentioned earlier, perhaps one of the saddest stories that I had heard from people were how they got into a difficult situation. How they got themselves between a rock and a hard place in life. And now they suffer. And now they are in hurt. And they are hurting and hurting and they don't have a way out of it. And that to me hurts because I can empathize with them. I can listen to their story and I can feel the pain too. And I just ask myself, you know, what, what happened? What went wrong? I was watching a report the other day and it was about the situation in the city of Portland, Oregon. If you don't know, Portland, Oregon, Oregon has decriminalized every drug. Every drug is decriminalized. As in, every drug is legal now in the city of Portland, Oregon. And some have called it the worst social experiment that has gotten so terribly wrong to this day. There are certain parts of Portland, Oregon that have homeless camps where the streets are lined with people overdosing and just at the edge of their life. Now there's a young man that in this report that was going around the city of Portland. The guy's name is Kevin. And here's what Kevin does. Kevin, he grew up in the city of Portland, Oregon. And he would go from area to area and he had seen the city. He used to remember how the city used to be beautiful. But then after these laws got passed, how the city had changed. He watched the whole thing. He's watched the cities he used to run around and he used to bike around had gotten rotten now. And what Kevin was going on about is that he's now trying to fix the problem. So what Kevin does is he runs around with a, with a, um, uh, with a packet of Narcan. Uh, Narcan is an opioid blocker, so just in case he gets jabbed by someone he's trying to help. So he runs around with an opioid blocker and he tries to help people. He tries to tell them how to get out of their situation of drug, addic uh, drug addiction. Now he also mentioned police don't do anything about the problem. In the city of Oregon, the only thing that matters is if a person's life is in danger. As in if they had overdosed or if somebody is about to get killed. That's the only reason they will stop the crime. If a car gets smashed in, if a car uh, gets into some kind of a trouble, uh, they're not going to do anything about it. If there's stolen goods somewhere, they're not going to do anything about it. So it's basically pandemonium in these areas of Portland, Oregon. I'm not saying every part of Portland, Oregon, okay? Just some parts. So Kevin went on in the report to explain how his life had started. He has already been at it for a few decades now. What Kevin said was he's gotten stabbed, he's gotten jabbed, he's gotten, uh, he's gotten uh, death threats, threats, he's gotten surrounded by people who wanted to, uh, to, who wanted to kill him, who beaten him up. And you just keep listening to Kevin's story and how he's trying to fix a problem but there's never going to come a fix for this issue because it's not the most important thing. He's watched people and he can tell you, oh, that person is doing this drug and that person is doing this drug. These people look like zombies. They're walking around. There's young people, ages 20 to 22. This report came out only four weeks ago. And you can see these young guys about the same age as the young adults. Some of them had gotten so high that they can't even speak because they had eaten their tongue during a high. So they can't even ask for help. As the report progressed, Kevin explained how a good majority of these people are actually hurt. 
They've gone through past trauma, but they looked in the wrong places for comfort. Many of these people can't think rationally. What happened is that they made one poor choice, which led them to the next poor choice, which le led them to the next poor choice. And ine inevitably, it got them to where they are today. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't think any of us struggle with a drug addiction. But I want you to see something. God's commands are there because he loves us. It's not there to hold us hostage. It's there because he loves us. He wants us to understand something. If we follow the commandments of God, it will help us from giant mistakes. That's the bottom line. The whole world, society, used to one, once it used to be a lot safer. It used to be that you can leave your doors open. It used to be that you, can, you didn't have to lock your doors at night. Because even though there were many unsafe people who didn't love the word of God, at least they revered it. I remember when I was younger, I went to school. And at the entrance of the school, you would see the Ten Commandments that were plastered on the wall. It was on a plaque. But now that school had removed it because it's hate, apparently. So let me ask you, let's ask ourselves, what matters most if we want to try and teach our kids? What matters most if we want to try and lead our young adults? What matters most if we want to try and lead our teens? It's really to love God. Love God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. You know, children watch us. Children watch us. They listen to what we say. They like to copy what we do. And they are really our reflections. They reflect us, but at an amplified, at an amplified point. I keep thinking to myself, I'm not my dad's son. No, I am my dad's son. <laughs> I'm very much so. My jokes, you know? There's even this little old story that I had read a couple of years ago where there was a pastor, he was visiting uh, this uh, family and only the mom and the little girl were at home that day. So the pastor came and he was going there for counseling to help this, uh, this family. And the mom, uh, she asked the pastor, all right, come in, yeah, let's sit down at, at the uh, dinner table and uh, we'll have this counseling session, right? And then uh, mom goes to the little, uh, her little uh, daughter and says, now go bring mommy her favorite book. And then the little girl goes and she brings the TV guide to mom. <laughs> TV guide, in case you don't know, is where the schedules for your favorite shows used to be, right? So it, it was once said, if you want to know the real situation at the home, ask the kids. Ask the children, what is the situation at the home? And then the kids will give you the unfiltered version of what's happening at the house. Right? Here's the source of what Jesus was actually quoting. Let's turn to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 6. Jesus didn't just come up with a new great commandment. He's actually just re-quoting what the Jews should have been teaching to their kids. So Deuteronomy chapter number 6, verse 4 to 7. Now Deuteronomy chapter number 6, verse 4 and 5 will look very familiar. But we'll read it from verse 4 to 7. Or I guess I'll read it. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, might. And these words 
which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. 24-7. 24-7. Do we have a strong prayer life? We're leaders. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Do we as leaders have a strong prayer life? Do we as leaders understand the importance of our devotional life to God? Here's another question. How about our worldviews? Are they biblically principled? Or do we base our worldview, the way we see the world, the way we do things in this world, do we do it because we learned it from the Bible or it's just something that the world has taught us? It's just been always part of culture. What is the reasoning behind why you do things? God commanded that the Israelites teach all these commands to their children and how important they are because God's commands really keep people from sin. That's the bottom line. Ladies and gentlemen, the greatest command, as Christ mentioned, is to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. But oftentimes, we only give part of our heart. I'll give you just this much, Lord. The rest I have for somebody else. Or sometimes it's, we only give a part of our mind. We oftentimes find ourselves scheming about our future. This is what I'm going to do when I get home tonight. But then, it needs to be fully given over to God. Sometimes we fall into the trap of caring about other things much more than God. Things like our money or our finances. Things like our debts. Things like our jobs. Things like our friends and what they're doing. Things like our favorite hobbies. And while those are not necessarily wrong, those things need to have a place in our life. It's true. But they should never outweigh our love for God. There is a way to behave ourselves around those things. And children see that. Children see how much importance we place on those other things. So I want to ask you, are we thankful for the finances we already have? Do we see money as a tool that God has given us for his glory? Do our resources, like our time, our talents, and our treasures, do our children see that those are being funneled towards our hobbies? Or are they being funneled towards ministries? towards the church, towards how we spend our time with God? Where do kids see it? Do they see us praying in the morning? Do they see us praying before our meals? Do they see us praying if there is prayer requests that are asked of us? Or how about when it comes to just prayer in general? Do they see us praying before big decisions in life? Do they see us giving at church? Do they see us looking forward to Sunday because we have the privilege to go to church, not that we have to go to church because it's Sunday? Do they see us engaging and participating in church and church activities? And these are honestly very important questions for us to ask ourselves because the next generation does see us. And often we can take Sunday and we can compartmentalize it for God, but then all the six other days, they're mine. I can do whatever I want. It's mine. But Christ tells us all of us need to be dedicated to loving God in all the aspects that we can possibly love God in. So let our children see that we love God with all our hearts with all our souls, and with all our minds. Now, if you want to look ahead, the second part, as you might have already guessed it, is loving God and loving your neighbor. 
That's the second part. So if you're in Matthew chapter 22, look at verse 39 to 40. Verse 39 to 40, it says, And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So the second part of what matters most in our love for our neighbors is our love for our neighbors. So why does this matter so much? First, Jesus tells us that this second commandment is just as important as the first, right? And we live in a day and age where this command, if you aren't paying attention, it can easily be perverted, right? Just love everyone, man. Doesn't matter. Keep in mind, loving someone does not mean that you allow them to live in sin. Right? Loving our neighbor requires God as our source for love. That's how it works. This love is bound by the law of the harvest. Does everyone know what the law of the harvest is? What you sow, you will reap. Right? So if you expect from others respect, dignity, compassion, courtesy, forgiveness, kindness, then we should do what we expect of others, right? And this can easily, very easily fall into something called partiality. So let's turn quickly to James chapter number two. Keep your finger here in Matthew. So James chapter number 2, you have verse 1 to 4. And the apostle here is trying to, he's trying to paint a picture here for us. If, uh, but try and see here what he's trying to paint. James 2, verse 1 to 4, it says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons? For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand out there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? See, James is trying to paint a picture here of uh, what happens when a high-status person comes into the church and then a low-status person comes into the church. Somebody, obviously, that you would rather hang out with and somebody you would rather not hang out with, right? Two different kinds of people. And James is trying uh, trying to portray it the poor person of lower status and the higher person with the higher status, if an unbeliever were to walk into the church now and he were to see how we act towards the poor and then how we act towards the rich or higher status or you name it, that unbeliever who were to see that, regardless of which era of human history we're talking here, he would definitely be turned off and he would just walk off. Why would he want to be a part of that? See, James chapter 2, take a look here, verse 8 to 10. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, here's the royal law, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. And look at this. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Put yourself in the shoes of other people. How do they see you? If we're to show biblical love towards others, we give people the benefit of the doubt. We don't murmur against people. We would speak kindly of others. 
at all times. And this also includes non-Christians. One of the things we would probably do is we would rejoice with people in their times of celebration. We would empathize with those in adversity or mourning. We would instruct those who live in, in simplicity or ignorance. We would help them that are in moments of weakness. We would reach out and show kindness to your friends and neighbors. Think, for, think of it if you were in their place. And I just want to remind you, children see these things. Children very much learn how to treat certain types of people because of what they saw from their peers or what they learned from their parents. There was a study where they looked at how children become bullies. Children end up becoming bullies in school because of their troubled homes most of the time. They get to school and try to demand respect and they try to have their own way without ever showing respect to anyone. But if children learn from us directly through our actions, how we treat people, imagine how much better of a witness the kids would be in their schools. Right? Jesus, he ends the discussion in Matthew twenty two forty, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you would imagine with me a chain. With this chain, you have loving God and you have loving your neighbor. Every good thing you've ever done is just another chain in this link. It's just another link in this chain. Now imagine something with me. Everything hangs on these two. Which means if you love God, you ought to also love your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you ought to also love your God. And then everything else comes into play. Every other good thing you've ever done. You cannot have one or the other. True religion begins and ends with the love of your God and the love of your fellow man. That's where true religion really is. Because you see, you can... By showing you love God and by showing you love your fellow man, what you're doing is you're proving to the next generation that what this Bible says is actually true. So prove to the next generation that your religion is not vain. These are the two grand links. Love God and love your neighbor. And without those two, our religion is just vain. It's just like any other religion in this world. Paul says in Romans 13.10, Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So I want to conclude here. Here's the conclusion. What matters the most in this life? If it was in two parts, we're going to answer it. What ought we pass over to the next generation? It comes in two parts. Adults, young adults, teenagers, you're all in a position to pass on a torch. You have a torch to pass on. And if you are saved, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. You can do it. You have the potential to walk in the Spirit every single day. Every single day. Every ministry that Grace Baptist Church is a part of requires these two parts. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Love your neighbors as yourself. Let me tell you this. You cannot reach the world or support missionaries around the world if you don't have these two parts. You cannot reach your city of Surrey without properly adhering to these two parts. 
You cannot sing in the choir without properly adhering to these two parts. You cannot serve in your church without properly adhering to these two parts. You cannot go to Bible college without properly adhering to these two parts. You cannot do the ministry in the media without properly adhering to these two parts. You cannot teach in the super church without properly adhering to these two parts. You cannot reach the children or your teenager or your neighbor or your fellow peers without properly adhering to these two parts. So purpose in your heart, purpose in your mind, and purpose it in your soul with everything you have. The deepest part of you that this is the direction that I'm going to go for the rest of 2023 and the rest of my life so that the next generation has something to look at so that when they see Christ, they see also you. And we can also see that when we strive for this as one in the church, that God will also help us to do it. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You want to do the rest of that chain? You want to do your good works? Have the first two links set. When Pastor White told me that you're going to start teaching the kids, and then he also said, you're going to also have to teach the young adults. I didn't know what to think of it. But I knew I have a Bible. I don't have that many skills to teach. And I know they're not there to actually learn of Deviant. They're there to learn about Jesus Christ. So what I did was I purposed in my heart that when I started to teach these kids, that my mission statement for that class is going to be that they may love God and they may love their church and love their Bible. Maybe one day I will make it a little better. But for now, my mission statement for my kids' class is that they may love God, they may love their Bible, and that they may love their church. If the kids see that I love my Bible, if the kids see that when I talk with people that it's done with courtesy and respect, if the kids see that Pastor Devian loves God and loves people, then I believe we would have gotten a little more closer to what matters most. Remember, if you keep what matters most, you'll get ever so closer to fixing the problem. So the children are watching, and they're copying you. What will you do about what matters most? What are we passing on to our kids? Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.